It's my privilege to be able to introduce to you someone who had direct experience of the events you've just seen, who is also an academic advisor to our center, who is a professor of peace and conflict studies at the University for Peace, and of course in this room we would argue equally importantly was a winner two years ago of the James Lawson Award. And that's Mary Elizabeth King. Thank you very much, Jack. I consider it a supreme honor that you've asked me to introduce Jim. And of course, I'm speaking of the Reverend Dr. James M. Lawson, but I will be calling him Jim. We've known each other too long for me not to do that. At 22 years of age, I went to work for the group that resulted from the students that you saw in the film. I'll tell you more about them in a moment. And in the civil rights movement, you must remember that ours was an interracial movement. And also I would mention that I have no relationship to Martin Luther King. My last name was a coincidence. In the movement, at the end of mass meetings, we would cross arms and hold hands to sing the signature anthem, We Shall Overcome. But when Jim crossed arms and held hands with Martin Luther King or with someone in the student movement, he made it possible for us, metaphorically and emblematically, to hold hands with people who had worked with Gandhi. Here at FSI this week, when you shake hands with Jim, you are touching hands that touched hands in India with people who worked with Gandhi. Let me explain. At the core of Jim's life is a fervent commitment to civil resistance. It led him to India, brought him to work with the two main southern civil rights organizations in the 1960s, took him to Memphis, then to Los Angeles, and in the years since to other scenes of conflict. As you know, the son of a Methodist minister and a mother who was very influential in shaping his fundamental views, Jim grew up in a family that received weekly periodicals from the African American press. One newspaper that was delivered to his home weekly was the Pittsburgh Courier. The editor of the Pittsburgh Courier had traveled to India. That editor was part of a great flow of African American leaders who traveled to India in a great interchange that took place between 1919 and 1955. We know this because of the work of a historian called Sudarshan Kapoor. Sudarshan Kapoor went into the morgues of 12 black-owned newspapers and journals in the United States and found four decades of reportage on black leaders traveling to India in steamership in order to learn from what was happening in the Indian independence struggles. They found that the anti-colonial struggles were avidly reported in the newspapers. And those African-American leaders came back to the United States and shared in lectures, public debates, writing essays, preaching sermons, what they had learned on the Indian subcontinent. But in fact, as soon as Jim learned how to read a newspaper, he became familiar with the experiments of Gandhi and the Indian struggles. Almost every night at dinner, his family would discuss news from India. 
Being reared in a parsonage, he was of course steeped in the study of the Bible, both the Old Testament and New Testament. But by his teen years, he had investigated thoroughly Gandhi's autobiography, translated into English in 1940. After Jim reached Baldwin Wallace College in Ohio, he studied Gandhi more systematically. Also, Henry David Thoreau's on the duty of civil disobedience, and the Russian Count Leo Tolstoy. Some scholars think that Tolstoy was partly responsible for Gandhi's appreciation that all systems are dependent on the obedience of the ruled and that cooperation can be withdrawn. Jim also studied the resistance to Hitler and Nazism in Europe. He buried himself in writings by British and American pacifists, of whom he considered himself one. Although pacifism and civil resistance are not the same, a number of pacifists have been instrumental in the use of nonviolent resistance. By the late 1940s and 1950s, growing up in Massillon, Ohio, Jim was organizing sit-ins aimed at establishments that discriminated against African Americans. He had also made up his mind that he would not cooperate with the United States government conscription for military service. On his 18th birthday, he registered for the draft, but wrote across the form that he was not sure that he was doing the right thing. By 1948, he had decided that he was indeed a conscientious objector. He concluded that there are some laws that a person of conscience cannot obey. First, he reached that determination with regard to laws of racial segregation, and then he decided for himself that it also pertained to military conscription. He had chosen to become a minister of the gospel, yet he did not seek the ministerial deferment to which he was entitled. Under the law, the clergy could be exempted from military service. He did not seek that exemption. Instead, he would be a non-cooperator with the draft. He sent his draft, board, his draft cards back to the draft board. The Federal Bureau of Investigation arrested Jim in 1950. He was then vice president of a national Methodist Youth Fellowship, and he had been accepted to teach high school in Zimbabwe. But once he declared himself a conscientious objector, the church petitioned the federal court to place him on probation under their control. The U.S. attorney, viewing him as a leader, fought this idea so as to make an example of him. Jim was not sent to Africa, but was found guilty and sentenced to three years in federal prison. He would serve for 13 months of that sentence from April 1951 to May 1952. Meanwhile, the Methodist Church was working on his behalf. The court released him into the hands of the Methodist Board of Missions, which assigned him to teach in India. In April 1953, he arrived in Nagpur in Maharashtra really at the crossroads of India. If you look at a map, it's right in dead center. This was about four years after Gandhi's assassination. And Jim spent the next three years teaching at Hislop College there, but he also traveled around India and met with many of the people who had worked with Gandhi and visited many of the sites of struggle. More than once, he met with Nehru, India's first prime minister. In August 1956, he returned to the United States, but en route through India, through Africa, sorry, uh, in East and Central Africa, West Africa, Kenya, Congo, Liberia, Sierra Leone. In 1957, he met the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in Oberlin, Ohio, and Dr. King implored him Come south immediately. We don't have anyone like you. At this time, he was offered a position as the representative for the Fellowship of Reconciliation 
the Southern Field Secretary for FOR, the Fellowship of Reconciliation was a pacifist organization started in Britain around the time of World War I. So by January 1958, Jim was based in Nashville, which is where the film begins. There in Nashville, he found that Glenn Smiley, the national director for FOR, had arranged a full schedule of workshops including one early in 1958 for the organization that Martin Luther King was president of as long as he lived, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And Jim led a workshop at their first meeting in Columbia, South Carolina. What happened is that Dr. King introduced him, explaining how FOR had been helpful during the Montgomery bus boycott. And he told the delegates to be sure to be back at 2 o'clock in the afternoon for Brother Lawson's workshop. And several minutes before the time appointed, Dr. King was sitting right up here in the front row where Erica Chenoweth is sitting. And he was waiting there for several minutes so that everybody noticed that he was waiting for the workshop to begin. Years later, Jim told me, Martin did that at every meeting of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference as long as he lived. He would ask me to conduct an afternoon workshop, usually for two or three hours, and arrange for it to be at large so there was nothing else competing. He put it on the schedule himself, and a few minutes early he would show up and sit alone as an example in the front row. Back in Nashville, as you know, in the autumn of 1959, Jim was running Monday evening workshops for students from the institutions of higher learning in the city. These students would become the heart of the Nashville movement, the ones you saw. Weekly, they worked together reading Gandhi's autobiography, The Bible, The Rose on the Duty of Civil Disobedience. Incidentally, as far as anyone knows, Thoreau did not use the term civil disobedience. That was added later. The students benefited from Jim's direct knowledge of Gandhi's workshop, Gandhi's experiments, and Jim's workshops gave a distinctive character to the local movement in Nashville. In February 1960, on the first day of the month, word broke from Greensboro, North Carolina, that four young black men had gone to a Woolworths lunch counter and sat down asked to be served. And when they were refused, they had stayed. Interestingly, they did not know the term sit-in. They were not familiar with the term. But Jim got a phone call from Greensboro saying that the four young men were sitting in. And immediately, 75 of the students with whom he had been working moved into action. They became the biggest most disciplined and influential campaign of what became the 1960 Southern Student Sit-In Movement. You saw Diane Nash in action. You saw John Lewis, who's been a member of the US Congress for 26 years. As a result of the Student Sit-In Movement, a mass movement of tens of thousands would emerge. It was the sit-ins that spread across the South that provided the regional base and the mass phenomenon for the civil rights movement, which we simply called the movement, the movement. We often put a capital T and a capital M with that. This was, of course, actually a movement of movements because each of the local movements often had different priorities. And as the sit-ins spread across the South, 70,000 were involved by the end of the year, and 3,600 would be arrested and go to prison. Most of them went limp in total non-cooperation. And as a result, a second organization came into being, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, which we pronounce SNCC, and for which I worked for four years. Jim was present at its founding meeting. He wrote the draft statement of purpose 
He became SNCC's primary tutor while he continued as a principal advisor to Dr. King and SCLC. You could not have had one without the other. Scholars have sometimes made a mistake in emphasizing only the role of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and Dr. King. It could not have been effective for the movement without the student wing. In conclusion, I want to highlight the fact that Jim was himself and his family a beneficiary of four decades of knowledge that moved across the planet to the black community in the United States. And then Jim himself became one of the most prominent propagators of knowledge going out around the world. You can also see from the film that the Nashville students studying with him were learning laterally, side to side. We now know that the lateral transmission of knowledge, not top down, but side to side, the sharing of lessons between and among movements is extremely important. Let me say this, Jim and the Nashville students were in large part responsible for SNCC's militancy. The Nashville movement stood out for its nonviolent discipline, its adamantine self-restraint, adamantine hard, its commitment to fiercely nonviolent action and strategic genius. I call Jim a living bridge between Gandhi, the civil rights movement, and today's civil resistance movements reaching intergenerationally. Tonight, you are about to learn from the person who did the most to shepherd the two key organizations of the movement in the theories, strategies, and methods of civil resistance, and who is still teaching the world. Thank you. And I'm so delighted to be here again at this eighth annual Institute at Tufts University and grateful for the privilege of seeing so many of you and I want on my own behalf to welcome you to this occasion. I want to express my deep appreciation to the founding of the ICNC by Peter Ackerman and Jack Duvall. This is an agency that I guess I have often wished for to happen. It has done more to disseminate and propagate and spread the word about the emergence of nonviolent struggle, nonviolent action, civil resistance, and the like than any other agency in the last 100 years. In fact, as one who came out of the pacifist tradition, it has done more for the work of getting people to recognize their own options to the present world, that there are options for how we fight and how we resist wrong, and to show forth the fact that these options are not written in uh, empty dreams, but written in the concrete work of millions, if not billions of people across the last 120 years, and actually more that, is, that, have not, that has not come forth in the academic world or in the church world or in the political world, but offers the best hope that the different visions of a better world, as has been mentioned already this evening, um, is possible. There are invisible worlds available in the political, social, economic, cultural, spiritual, moral realm in the United States, in your nation, in all of our nations. We do not have the best kind of world at all. There are visions indeed that can be achieved, but they will not be achieved unless somehow emerging out of the tumult of our times, we recognize that we have not been left 
weaponless against monumental evil or struggle, a war of violence, or social injustice. We have weapons. They are old weapons stretching back into the unwritten history of the human race. They represent the wisdom of people from all around the earth of knowing full well that it's possible to resist an act of injustice not by imitating the act of injustice but by creative courage and creative intelligence and creative understanding. If the 21st century is to allow the human race to achieve its potential for the kind of world where we are a single humanity united to the journey of life and expecting to expand that journey beyond our own imaginations, it's going to be through nonviolent struggle, nonviolent conflict, through civil resistance in community after community. And I say to you that the great issue in the 21st century is whether or not we can make this emerge with such a veracity and such power and such breadth and depth that, in fact, we can cause the power structures of our world today, especially the power structures in Western civilization, to desert the traditional pathway of its own violence and wastage of life and limb and resources and to adopt more clearly this wisdom of a million years maybe that you can resist with your head and your heart and your soul you can resist with your very body and the consequences for you, the consequences for your family and your community and the consequences for the results that you effect uh, will be far more palatable than the way these power structures are working today in, in our world. So I want to thank ICNC uh, and Jack and Peter and then for your being here this evening as well. I hope you'll use this week not only to get acquainted with each other, not only to raise the questions you need to raise about your struggles in your own part, part of the world, but I hope you will catch a glimmer of a force more powerful. Uh, as Gandhi said, a force more powerful than electricity, a force more powerful than ether. He said in other places, it is the greatest power available to humanity. And if we can begin to tap that power, I hope you will see that possibilities in this institute over the next seven days and that it will enrich and deepen your life. Uh, indeed. This film this evening, of course, is uh, from my perspective, a good training, teaching film, and I'm grateful for that. But I would like to say very, very quickly just one or two things about that film and about that experience that I had. It was the first time that I had, after some 10 years of practice and study of struggles and of movements, both violent struggles as well as nonviolent struggles. It was the first time that I had the opportunity to try to plan a struggle, <laughs> plan a campaign. And so I have to admit very quickly that I really did not know what I was doing. <laughs> uh, and <laughs> that it came out so well was to me even still an astonishing fact. But this film does represent a deliberate decision to have such a campaign, to do it in a nonviolent fashion, and to do it on a major issue of justice and justice, uh, of injustice in the United States. And it was not my decision alone because I applied to the Nashville scene basically a two-step process, which uh, I understood to be a Gandhian methodology. 
and I began with an assessment um, with other people in Nashville and you saw a couple of the pictures of people who were there um, and in that assessment of the Nashville scene what are the issues what are these issues about what is our city like what is the plight of black people in this city what's the meaning of Jim Crow law and segregation in Nashville, it was not a law, it was a custom that <laughs> grew out of the 19th century. I think this is correct, that there were no laws in Nashville per se, not even a state law that required segregation of the races. So there we're dealing with a cultural artifact of not more than maybe 75 years old, but was nevertheless a deadly artifacts in Nashville itself. And out of that assessment that took some six months of talking weekly, um, we amateurs determined that our goal was going to be to desegregate downtown Nashville. Now up to that particular time, no city had made that, no group of people anywhere in our country made that uh, sort of determination. I can say that. Uh, in the United States there were signs besides colored white in Nashville. There were anti-Jewish signs and WAP signs and anti-dirty Irish signs and signs against Chinese people, signs against Mexican Americans and Japanese people. Uh, and these signs were not all by law. Many of them were by custom and attitudes in places like South Dakota signs against Indians who might come in for a restaurant, a skating rink, a theater, and so forth and so on. So it was one of the, one of the shames of my country uh, for the most part. This was the first time that any group of people took a hostile attitude towards those signs as a people. And so the decision was made, we will desegregate downtown Nashville. And we will, we will prepare for it. We will have a strategic plan, and it was a very simple plan. But a part of the preparation and the recruitment was that we would recruit, recruit young and old alike, and that we would have uh, the training and preparation in nonviolent struggle uh, in the fall and then begin to, re to, to engage in the public phase afterwards. So I would stress to you the importance of protest and action and activism that is rooted in systematic decision-making on the part of people. Um, assessing your scenery, uh, not top-down stuff, which I do not think can work ever, but from your own community, from your own people. Uh, getting a small group perhaps initially together to assess your scene and to see the possibilities of change and make some choices, that is, that represent, make a choice rather that represents a sy systematic choice, a strategic choice. And we did that in Nashville. The second thing we did was prepare for it. Uh, we had a, a, some folk who were so inspired by the Montgomery bus boycott of 1955-57 that they thought it could be done again. One of those persons is in the film Kelly Miller Smith, uh, a, a, Bapt, a Baptist pastor in downtown area of Nashville. He was a friend of Martin Luther King Jr. He was convinced the bus boycott was not an accident. He was convinced personally that there could be other campaigns of nonviolence. And as I traveled around the South in all sorts of crises areas in 1958 especially, um, I came to the recognition that SCLC and Martin King did not know what the next step was and that maybe some of us in Nashville 
to begin to turn our attention to whether or not there's a next step for nonviolent struggle. Uh, Kelly Miller was of that mind, Andrew White was of that mind, Helen Roberts was of that mind, um, Dolores Wilkerson was of that mind. And so when we started the assessment, we had other people who had been inspired by the Montgomery bus boycott as a nonviolent weapon and thought it could be done again. So we worked from that angle. We prepared people well going through a great variety of issues. The sit-in, for example, had been used in the United States by the Congress of Racial Equality in 1942 and 43, and I knew about those from my college reading. So I rehearsed those as a part of what, an American experiment in struggle against racial injustice and discrimination. Um, I knew, for example, of uh, one of the best illustrations of nonviolence that I know of, and it wasn't called that then, in 1943 in Berlin, when um, from the top down in the German Reich, the decision was made that, made that Berlin would no longer have any uh, Jews living in that city. And so the last batch of Jewish men who were married to German women were picked up and arrested by the SS and thrown into a community center where the few, a few were shipped further east. Called Now, this happened spontaneously. The wives learning that their husbands had been picked up in this fashion surrounded the Rosenstrasse Center in the street in the figures of several hundred people and simply insisted, release our husbands. Where is my husband? I want my husband. Uh, the Gestapo and even Hitler did not know what to do with this act of defiance. As I've said already, it was not a planned affair. They did not call it nonviolence, but those women acting on their best instincts for two or three days or so refused to budge. And the net result was that the Gestapo and Goebbels, the second man in charge of the Reich, um, insist, said with Hitler's approval, we'll let these Jewish husbands go and they return to their homes. A remarkable story in the midst of warfare, in the midst of the, um, this tyrannical German government and society at that time. So I knew about that from my study and I, that was another of the illustrations I used. I gave, to the best of my ability, an analysis of the Montgomery bus boycott of the Salt March in India in 1930 by Gandhi and of his work, and of his work in South Africa. So I provided people with that kind of historical background, and of course, as Diane says, Diane Nash says, I didn't think nonviolence would work. Well, nonviolence was not a major word in American language or conversation at that time in 19. In, even in 1959 or 1960, though the bus, bus boycott and Martin King helped to make it a word that uh, uh, appeared again in, uh, in media and conversation. So to make a long story short, we prepared intensely uh, so that some of the pieces that you saw in the film could move in a unified fashion from our struggle. And I have to tell you, I'll tell you this fact, that in spite of the fact we came from around the country, and in spite of the fact that we were students, and then people myself, like myself, my age, again and again in turmoil, we could come to a consensus on making basic decisions
for our strategy, for our tactics. Every decision in this film was a tactical decision by the Central Committee and the rest of us. It was not an accident. It happened deliberately by the planning and thinking of a very fine group, one of the finest groups of people I've ever uh, any time met. So we prepared ourselves for that. The importance of that campaign is that it did help to disseminate the notion that we have weapons that we can use that do not imitate the weaponry of segregation, racism, and fear. It was an important piece of the emergence of what I called the nonviolent dimension of the civil rights movement. An absolutely essential piece for that dimension of the civil rights movement. Because in 1961, a small organization organized a freedom ride. The freedom ride was met in Alabama with burning buses with mob actions where the police and the FBI and the White Citizens Council and the governors conspired, actually, quietly, to permit the bus riders to be at the mercy of white mobs that had only an intention of lynching, of beating back this legitimate, peaceful assembly called the Freedom Ride. That attack was so fierce and damaging that the ride was going to end as a campaign in, uh, Montgomery, in Birmingham. And when the riders went on ahead to New Orleans by plane, uh, it was in Nashville, because of which because of our training in nonviolence, our group said, we cannot allow these enemies of truth in the United States to win a battle against the peaceful demonstration. In many ways, the emergence of the movement would suffer irreparably if we permitted it to happen. And so the national people who were trained on the role of violence and repression, we made a, again a consensus decision, we will not let that freedom ride in. We ourselves will pick up the cudgels and continue it from Birmingham to Montgomery to Jackson and to wherever else. Um, a faithful decision, but it meant, among other things, that then the groups like SNCC and SCLC and the NAACP and the Congress of Racial Equality and other groups came back together to, su to su support that movement onward. And more than 400 and some people were eventually arrested in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, and some of us spent time in the, in the, in the Mississippi Penitentiary uh, parchment, uh, which was a horror story in the South at that time as well. Well, that preparation and effort to make nonviolence a, a strategic, systematic, social change enterprise allowed this nonviolent movement in the United States to emerge in the Freedom Ride. And then out of the jails of Mississippi came the Albany movement, and then the Birmingham movement that is celebrating its 50th year today. And beyond that, this Mississippi Summer Movement and the Freedom Democratic Party. And then the Selma to Montgomery uh, March that produced the Civil Rights Bill of 1965. All of those together, over a period of time, helped to accelerate the momentum for change in the United States and did cause the mentality of my land to make a decided decision that it was time to face up to these issues and to make the changes that could be made. 
Now the task is not over by any means in the United States, but in that we share your task because I happen to think that the huge problem in the 21st century is our in nation after nation moving the human values from the wish list to joining in the conflicts in every nation that help our, will help each nation to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to make education available, to decrease the levels of violence and hostility and hatred among themselves, and to allow a different spirit and a different power to take effect in our world. I would say finally that this is not an accidental moment for you because nonviolent struggle, its theory, its practice, its empowerment of ordinary people, which I think is at the heart of it, its empowerment of ordinary people. You have the power of the universe in your bones, the power of life. Use it. Don't believe the propaganda or the mythologies that you were birthed impotently. But seek to know that gift of life and creation and to use it. Because you may be the, on the front lines for helping the nations of the earth recognize that the welfare of all our peoples is the number one business of any government. That any government worth the name with which it names itself or calls itself must indeed be a government that's seeking to make quality education accessible to every child. That sees to it that babies, 22,000 of them a day in around the world, cease to die in the first year of life. That we handle conflicts not for narrow political reasons, but for the capacity to discover the strength to solve and heal. It is true from my perspective that our generation of people from about the 1960s, the first generation of human beings that had the opportunity, or rather had the power to commit suicide, either as British uh, poet Eliot said, by a whimper or a bang. And if we are, as a people, and I mean all of us as the human family, if we are to avoid the traps that many power structures in the United States have caught us in, it will be because we replace the power of violence with the power of nonviolent struggle. We will replace the hostility of violence with the sense of the dignity of every human life. And we will replace the weapons that can destroy and devastate with the weapons that can sow the seeds for a new world.